So as today, like I mentioned to you, uh, the agenda for today's topic is going to be the spectrum of qualitative research. And then, uh, I'm sorry, you, you can actually, um, you know, um, just unmute yourself if you want to ask questions because I'm afraid that when I'm on full screen, I cannot see your chats, okay? Uh, then, um, second part of the talk would be on designing qualitative methodology. So what are the components that are needed if you're doing qualitative uh, methodology and how you should arrange it in your uh, thesis chapter? Okay, so because most in most uh, PhD um, phases, I, I, I found that PhD thesis, the way you write your methodology chapter, some, so I, I'm pretty sure that um, qualitative analysis or qualitative methodology is quite popular in our faculty, which is a uh, faculty of built environment and um, surveying, uh, because we are sort of like management-ish, um, social science-ish, uh, but we also carry out certain, um, you know, technical, more technical or engineering-based research. So why qualitative research is, I think the value of qualitative research is that you'll be able to capture deep and rich data for you to interpret those understanding and then create new knowledge or findings based on your interpretation of what you have uh, of what you have researched. For instance, you have um, a theory, uh, several theories or let's say technology theories. You have um, technology organization and environment, which is a TOE framework theory, or you have technology acceptance theory or any kinds of theories. And then you see that there is a research that is um, probably on certain aspects, for instance, electric vehicles or uh, electric vehicles implementation in real estate, for instance, or big data application in construction, for instance. But these kinds of research are much more popular in other avenues, for instance, maybe computer science avenue or maybe engineering based avenues that hasn't yet been introduced in, not hasn't yet been introduced, but limitedly being introduced in construction or in the built environment sector. Therefore, if you want to, you know, such, such, such in a way that you want to research on how these things can work in the built environment sector, you can use qualitative research as your methodology. Okay, so the selection of qualitative methodology or quantitative method methodology really depends on the kind of um, objective that you have for your research. Um, I don't know, basically, I think based from my uh, my experience itself, at first when I started my PhD, probably in my like first or second semester, um, in, in such a way, we, 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 in the, so I think the first part origin in terms of um, methodology, the chapter three, most of us um, really hate this part, which is paradigm and philosophies, which involves ontology, epistemology, blah, 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 blah. I myself, when I do uh, my PhD, I think that I only got this understanding right after I finished after uh, I finished writing my whole thesis, then it suddenly makes sense to me. While while I was doing my chapter three, research paradigm and philosophies is something that I hate because I don't really understand the needs of it. But probably you'll be able to appraise the needs of it when you are really doing your data analysis because the selection of paradigm and philosophies is really related to you and your research, and it will guide you on how you do um, quality research analysis. So I think. Uh, many people tend to think that this part of the methodology is not important. Um, but to me, it is important because it is your belief and how you view the world. And different people view the world differently. That's why we have different, different uh, like positivism, post-positivism, creative, the uh, critical theory and constructivism. Because the way we are human and we are made differently and the way we view things differently. But none is... Uh, right or wrong compared to one another lah, okay? So your paradigm must be idiosyncratic, idiosyncratic or it must be aligned to each research. So the way you view the selection of paradigm in, in qualitative research per se, the selection of paradigm will enable that if other people were to actually conduct the same research as yours, he or she cannot get the same findings, the same exact findings of yours because there is two, there is never two person in the world could carry the certain research in the, within the same way, if your paradigm and the way you think and the way you believe are different. Okay, so ontology is about how you yourself view what is reality. You know, some people, let's say, if, if, if those people fall into the characteristic, uh, the category of positivism, they are the kind of people who believe facts must be proven and can be proven and reality has to be the same with everyone. For instance, if um, Sakiru, he views A is A, then everybody in this world must view A is A, cannot be A negative or A positive, something like that. So these kind of people will tenderly shape their research to be quantitative because the way they view um, the, 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 the world, the reality. For me, I would fall somewhere around constructivism because I believe in whatever, uh, in whatever we do, the reality is shaped by the people who are in the reality. And A can be blue, a can be red, A can be orange, for instance, depending on how the people shape it or see or believe it. There is no right or wrong between it, okay? So these kind of philosophies is rooted within you. You cannot change it. And the third one, so now we come to the research design. Uh, research design is how 
it's how you carry out your research. What are the processes that you do uh, for you to carry out your research? So there is, uh, like just now, um, you have to align your philosophical views, the ontology, epistemology, blah, 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 just now in the previous slide. You have to realign it, like I said, with your research approach, your selection of main methodology, and how you carry on your carry out your strategy and your research technique. So for like I mentioned just now, if you are post-positivism or you positivism, you are dominantly will be on quantitative. And if you are in FABU, mostly you will do non-experimental. Experimental is more on like um uh more on like um lab work, you know, for those in in engineering. So uh, if you are uh, non-experimental, is uh you will do um uh maybe surveys, those kind of things. So then your research uh, strategy would be survey, causal comparative, or correlational analysis. So if you are uh, constructivism, you are mostly doing qualitative. And if you're choosing qualitative, you will have um several variation of strategy, which is case study, uh ethnography, uh grounded theory, and so whatnot. Dominantly in um in built environment research. We will dominate, if you're doing pure qualitative, you will mostly fall into case study or grounded theory or ethnography for me. I think like, that's from my perspective. And within this spectrum, grounded theory is known as one of the hardest, the, the, the hardest spectrum of qualitative research. But after going through, I myself, when I was doing my PhD, I'm doing um, grounded theory, pure grounded theory. Uh, but I don't think so that it's difficult. So please do not shy away from from for instance if you're doing um if you're doing uh, quantitative they tend to uh to... so like i said just now uh i would like to see when i read uh, as an examiner i would like to see when i read the methodology um chapter i would like to see a very structured uh way on how you write your uh chapter three so usually it will start with your research philosophy the one that i mentioned just now what are your ontology what are your epistemology and please refrain from just writing oh anthology uh uh you know we have constructivism post constructivism blah, 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 blah. When you write your research philosophy, you can just do a, a little introduction on, you know, there are, you know, four domains, research philosophy or whatever, whatever. But please, when you write your chapter three, relate it with your stand in on the research. So your research wants to carry out whatever, 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 A, B, C, for instance. And then you relate it why you choose that philosophy, why you have that philosophy, and you tidy it up together with what your research wants to do and you, you yourself in terms of how you weigh your, how you view the world. Okay, that's very important because mostly when I, I reach I read chapter three in the very beginning, people would just, you know, um rewrite back whatever they read in the book in terms of ontology, epistemology, and put it in chapter three, which I think it's just pointless to do that. And then after you re-establish your uh, uh philosophy, that which is the ontology and epistemology, then only you write your selection of methodology, your domain, the umbrella methodology, which is whether you want to use quantitative or you want to use qualitative or you want to use mixed method. Okay, so after that, only you use your strategy, only you introduce your strategy, whether if you choose qualitative, then you want to use case study, or you want to use grounded theory, or you want to use observation, observation research. Okay, so after you have established that, then only you write your sampling. Okay, so sometimes sam sampling and data collection strategy can be, um, how do I say, intertwined. You know, some researchers put data collection strategy, uh, data collection strategy first, then only they put sampling. Some researchers would write sampling first, then they write data collection strategy. It actually, I mean, the, the two of it don't have a very, uh, how do I say, a very uh, ob obvious uh, obvious line that demarcates what is which. So it really depends on how you, the way you write. So either or, it is accepted. So mostly you will write, some people would write data collection strategy, so they would. So so now we have come to the second part of the uh, of the sharing session. I would, call, I would like to call this a sharing session. This is the second part where we will do the hands-on on qualitative uh, and vivo analysis. So you click the interview, uh, one sample of interview, and then you click explore. You click word frequency. After that, after clicking word, uh, after clicking word frequency here, you can just uh, collect. Uh, you select files and externals, which which means you select this everything inside, this file, and then you uh, you run coding. So we'll analyze the transcript to the transcript itself, stating that what are the words that is repeatedly said by the interviewee or the person you interview. Okay, so you want a better visualization is that so you can see ah okay this person uh, participant one is talking mostly about data and he is mostly talking about cost system. So the bigger the word is and the much more it is at the center of the word cloud. It is more significant for that interviewer uh, for that interviewee sorry for that participant okay so you kind of like get the rough idea for um for your interviewee lah, what are they saying so you can actually left click and or right click and you can print it out 
So you can print this if it makes sense for you and then you put it in your um, data analysis chapter later on, chapter four, okay? So different people might have a different, uh, different word club. So let's check whether P, uh, participant one and participant two, their, 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 their word club is the same or not. So yes, so the second person only also mainly talking about data uh, and then they talk about project, for instance, and costs. So on top of the participant one who talks about data and cost, this person talks about data and project, for instance. So you can just like, you know, have a quick, uh, have a quick, uh, quick word or quick check about um, what your, your interviewee is saying. Lah, okay. After you have done that. So this is where the tabs here is where you can just go to your previous analysis or what you have done. Lah. If you don't want, you just click and then it will just go vanish. Lah. So that is word familiarization, one technique. Okay. That is called word cloud. Word cloud. Okay. For instance, she, he or she is talking about that is why it is limited to five years because we use straight line regression. For instance, this um, is analytics. Analytics, uh, this is analytics techniques because it is straight line re regression. This is very descriptive. Mathematical statistics. Okay, so the selection of whether you want to use description focus coding or interpretation focus coding is entirely depending on the kind of information that you're participant give you. If the participant is addressing very basic uh, fundamental questions, then you mostly is going to be is going to use description focus coding. But if your your participant is giving you data something that is very complex, very deep, and very uh, subjective or abstract, then you use interpretation focus coding. But you can also use both. Just uh, what you need to do is if you use uh, qualitative research, you have this thing called memos. So you just note Okay, if you do description, yeah, which code is description focus coding and which code is interpretation focus Sorry. coding. So this is to protect yourself when, when you are doing there. your Stop. viva later on. Okay, so how do you code? Okay, how do you yes. code? For instance, here you want to code. Uh, my findings is very, very, very extensive. For one um, interview, sometimes I, I have up to 18 pages. So which is why it's going to be a lot. Some interviews, shorter interviews, usually it will fall between five to eight, but a very rich and uh, a very rich findings interview would give you up to 20 pages. Okay. For instance, QS need to find something to back up their decision. So maybe mm, this one is data-driven decision-making. For instance, you want to code it as data-driven decision-making. So how to code is you highlight what you want to code. So I want to code this word or this sentence. You double-click and then you go to code selection. You try new code. You click to new code. Okay, then name the codes. You want to write data-driven decision-making. And then please click on aggregate coding from child codes and then click done. So the thing will be code here. So if you look at here, codes, see, there is a new code is already appeared in the system called data-driven decision-making. Okay, maybe sometimes uh, other, other codes, for instance, second code, you want to do uh, government support, for instance. So you highlight this sentence. So maybe this sentence represents government support. So you double-click and then you could code selection, new code selection. And then you use, you write the name, government support. And then you click here and you click that. Okay, so how do you do your analysis relating to your theory? So theory, for instance, if you use, like mine, I, my research use technology, organization, and environment theory. So whatever that you want to find is based on your understanding, understanding based on those theories. So those understanding from the theory can be applied for you to find whatever item that is in your transcript. For instance, if you want to code something that is already in the the code that you have done. For instance, you want to add to data-driven decision-making code. For instance, okay, maybe this is also data-driven decision-making. So instead of double-clicking, what you can do is just highlight and then you drag this thing into data-driven decision-making. Okay, so if you click data-driven decision-making, you can see that there is already two codes inside here. So what you do is you go through the whole transcript and then you uh, quote the findings. So maybe this one is... Uh, I don't know, um, bureaucracy, maybe, I don't know, okay. Then you will create codes. So you have to do this for the transcript and then you, you repeat the same process for this, the next person, okay. So the next person, maybe, I think, I, let, let's just assume, okay. So maybe this like constant comparison metrics on top of condition relationship metrics, or you can also use paradigm model. So these are really uh, depending on the, the, the kind of analysis that you want to do. Okay, I will show you condition relationship metrics. So 
condition relationship matrix is um, okay this is condition relationship matrix condition relationship matrix is allowing you to to synthesize all the codes into uh, several clusters or several finding find uh, meaningful findings how you do is you put your codes here which is actual codes actual codes is the one that you are establishing in here for instance uh, you want to talk about data so here data for instance you write data so then you first do not put y because this is the last that you have to put what you have to do first is with or what ask your question uh, ask yourself question with what properties so what is the properties of data for instance here properties of data are data security data access data availability data characteristics you think that that might be the properties of data so you put here what is your understanding based on all the things that you have quotes so what you want to when you want to check what you have quotes is you just you know click this too okay this talks about data security this is what you quote from the interview that you have done okay so then with what also sometimes you need facilitation and then you need to ask yourself how for instance data security how is the data security being established so based on your findings in the data here you answer yourself here and then here this this column is concerns so you can write whatever you ask yourself sometimes oh i'm not sure about this or a is contingent to b a is contingent to c for instance so once you have finished writing this column properties facilitation and relationship then you can only do definition because definition in you click diagram compare quotes and then underneath this you want to compare this and this for instance or you want to compare underneath big data attributes you want to compare power and you want to compare skills so you select when you do comparison you can only compare two things okay because comparison is like one in comparison to another so you click two things that you want to compare and you put select so you can see here when you talk about skills and when you talk about power there's only two person who says this thing which is this participant one and participant two and when you click inside you can see what are the things that they talk about okay uh, where's the visualization just now it is gone hold on yeah let me try another one so you can also check parent and children code please check all the boxes so that you can see the interrelationship so this person interviewee one is talking about data sharing culture and also talking about flexibility and within the big data attributes data sharing culture and flexibility is really important because it influence see big data is in, attribute is influenced by data sharing culture but it influence flexibility in terms of getting data from the industry for instance so when you look into the relationship here then you can actually it helps you to make sense what are the people saying it helps to actually uh, create a narrative for you to tell your findings analysis in a good way that is understandable okay mm, okay so just check all the boxes here so, so we do a last one um, maybe you want to do um, here power so you take diagrams quotes and then let's do maybe big data potential we use this one and then we want to compare it with oh no this one and this one select see these are the people uh, four participant is talking about um, data driven decision making and centralized data accessibility so you can write about this so see and it is within big data potential and all these things impacts competitiveness so this is how you visualize the data again if you want to print this right click and then create print or export diagram sorry uh, usually we use export diagram and then uh, analysis link data on competitiveness maybe because all those leads to competitiveness right and then okay okay so you will have that in pdf here where's my cursor Tada! so you can take this snapshot this picture and put it in your chapter four okay i think that is all the visualization that is important visualization for you to support your findings uh, i would like to remind you again that you don't have to do all of the visualization the visualization is selected based on how you want to represent your findings in a meaningful way. Okay, so I think that is it from me today. Uh, thank you very much. This is.